in a world of black and white. I am the shades of gray in between. I am the bridge. What is a bridge if not trampled by feet? What does it mean to be biracial? One of the hardest things is existing in spaces that aren't defined for me. White people might assume by the color of my skin that I'm aggressive, violent, or stupid. While my tone changes the notes of darker folks, inclining them toward mistrust. I am muddied. So let me make it crystal clear when I say that I'm cajoled into complying with stereotypes. But for people like me, kids of mixed race, there isn't any news network to turn to teaching me that my heritage makes me hateful. I'm a bastardization. A confused conjugation of plunderer and plundered. My history punctuated with the hunger to be more than the filling of a false dichotomy. Though heinous acts of history produced me, don't get it twisted. My grayness produces privilege. I've struck a chord, but I don't need sympathy. I'm composed of a symphony, steady pain harmonizing with the potential of self-love. It's brought to me an epiphany that my existence is perturbing. It causes some cognitive dissonance. I'm seen as a half step up when really I'm a whole note. So I say, good riddance to pretending to be white and woke. And I better step up to filling in my identity. The notion of me is delusional to those lost in the illusion of race. And though I've been excluded from the conclusion of race, it's a different struggle I face. I'm seen as a class B minority. But I better be sharp, because I'm still seeing the dark side of the American dream. Let it be known that I'm uniquely me. My melanin sings its own melody. I choose to be black, and I will not be attacked or defined by the enemy. My vitality is rapturous. Whiteness is a setback. It's cacophonous. So when I'm pushed into a locker and called nigger for my black, just know I push back, and I'm bigger than that, and I dare you. Try to cage me again, because the me you had before, I'm even blacker than him. I'm like a whole new man, injected with black. I'm not ashamed of my auntie who got addicted to crack, or the man on the L who told me to keep warm, or the boy on the sidewalk always watching his back because I know if I keep on exploring, I'll find myself in them. We're all seen as black. One drop and we're roped in. One drop and we're roped up. Strung in a tree, not tied. Noose tight, not dead. Not stopped, because we hang hand in hand. And we stand together against whatever weapons of mass incarceration are mounted against us. Blackness means surviving. And whether I'm sable, sand, or anything in between, I am a survivor and a scholar and a thriver who loves every other member of this family spanning oceans. And I'm making motions 
and movements proving only to me that I have what it takes to face the greatness within myself. I'm black and I'm proud. Thank you. Um, Grant. I think I speak for Tara when I say we are so happy for you that you have come to love your black and brown and biracial self so early. Mm -hmm. um, I'm envious. The 17-year-old the in me wishes she felt remotely like you obviously do. On the Real American Book Tour, I've been on tour for about six weeks, I've asked at every stop can we find a youth in the local community if I'm at a bookstore? Can we find a youth in the student body if I come to a school who will read some original work of poetry, spoken word, about blackness, about being the other? And um, Grant, it's been an amazing tour with a lot of amazing young people, but you blew my mind today. And uh, so congratulations to you. I do this because as a 49-year-old author with two books on a book tour with book number two and a microphone and a stage and a podium, I have an opportunity in this moment. And on book tour, I want to step aside and provide that opportunity for someone younger than me to come and do his or her thing, you know, to extend my hand and reach out and grab yours and pull you up here. That's the purpose of this youth reader um, aspect of what we try to do with, with the Real American Book Tour, so thank you. Um, well, I'm just speechless. I feel like in terms of seeing another young poet, that does my heart good because for the past 20 years, I've worked with teen poets, so please encourage young people to speak because who's gonna look out for us when we can't speak for ourselves? So for me, that's really important and I'm really just excited to be here. Thank you so much for not just supporting FAN, but supporting the importance of literacy and reading and reading critically. So thank you. Yeah. So are you gonna sit up here while yeah, I? Okay. You can sit, okay. what do you wanna do? Yeah, that sounds good. I think I'm gonna read, I think I'm gonna stand and read it. So okay. is that cool? cool? When you're ready. Um, the last thing I want to say is when Lonnie and I were on email trying to figure out when I was going to get to come back here for this book, we were looking at October because my book came out in early October and she said, you can't come in October. Why? Because the Cubs might be in the series. <laughs> she said, you can't come in October because you know people will not come out for an event if the Cubs are playing. So guess where I was during the World Series? Los Angeles and Texas. <laughs> Literally, and I was like, Lonnie. Um, and then I posted that on Facebook, and people were like, come to my city next October, you know? Um, anyway, all right. So I've written this memoir, Real American. I'm 49 years old. I'm African American. I'm also biracial. My mother is white. My father is black. Um, this is my journey of how I learned to locate a self I could love as a black woman with a white mother in a country where black lives weren't meant to matter. And that's a bit of a paraphrase from Michelle Alexander, the New York Times bestselling author of The New Jim Crow, who wrote a blurb for the back of my book, the bit about black lives weren't meant to matter. I was locating a self I could love in a country where black lives weren't meant to matter. Mm -hmm. um, so I am, this book is in nine parts. Um, most, you know, a, a work of fiction, many memoirs tw have an arc that goes like this. We're supposed to build some conflict and, and create some tension, and that r pulls the reader along through the book, more and more suspense, and so on and so on, until, you know, you have the climax of that action and then the denouement. That's just sort of the classical line um, of a work of this length. And um, my book has a pit. So if the classical arc is an A, my, my, my book is a letter V. The nine parts of it are, it begins like this, an American childhood becoming the other, desperate to belong, self-loathing, emerging, declaring Black Lives Matter onward. And what I'm gonna try to do is just read a few bits to give you a glimpse 
I think I'm gonna read from kind of the first section and the second to last section, just to try to give you a sense um, of, of my journey. Um, it's a prose poetry memoir, which means there are places where the, the prose violates the rules of syntax, where I let the words be on the page in ways that uh, support my intentions. If you get the book afterward, and I hope you will, it's the holidays. You might even pick up a copy for a friend as a gift. Everyone loves to read about race and racism, right? Um, if you get the book, I used to joke on my parenting book tour, oh, my next book is on a much easier subject than parenting, race, you know, because everyone takes parenting so seriously. If you get the book, you will find yourself saying, did she intend that? There's a lot of white space on the page. Did she intend that? There's no punctuation here. Did she? Yes, she intended it, okay? It's all <laughs> intended. All right, so I'm just gonna try to read some excerpts here. Um, and I wanna just try to pay attention to time. Normally I read for longer, but I'm not in conversation with somebody. So I just wanna respect the fact that this format is different and not go over my time. Okay, so... Um, Let's see. It begins like this. Where are you from? Here. No, I mean, where are you from from? As a child growing up in the 70s and early 80s in New York, Wisconsin, and Northern Virginia, there was something about my skin color and hair texture that snagged the attention of white children and adults. Their need to make sense of me, to make something of sense out of nonsensical me, was pressing. My existence was a ripple in an otherwise smooth sheet. They needed to iron it down. The truth is, I'm not really from here. The truth is, that's not what they were asking. The truth is, they were asking, why are you so unclassifiable, so different from what I know? There's love at first sight. Well, there's American at first sight. And from dozens of where are you from interactions with Americans over the years, I've learned that American at first sight is about looks, primarily skin color and hair texture, not nationality. I am the woolly haired, medium brown skinned offspring typical when blacks and whites have sex, which was considered illegal activity in 17 of the 50 United States in 1966. 66 was the year before the Supreme Court decided in Loving versus Virginia that the laws preventing interracial marriage were unconstitutional. And 66 was the year in which my black father and white mother, an African-American doctor and a British teacher who met in West Africa, chose to go ahead and get married anyway. They married in Accra, Ghana. I was born to them in Lagos, Nigeria in 1967. So I come from people who broke the rules chose to live lives outside the box, chose hope over hate, as the arc of history was forced to bend a bit more toward justice. I am the goo in the melting pot, rhetorically championed, theoretically accepted, actually suspect, in places hated, despised. In the lead up to the 2008 presidential election, a persona stepped to the forefront of public consciousness, that of the real American. These real Americans found a voice in their candidates, grew in number, became a mob who raised slogans, signs, fists, and arms, who longed to make America great, normal, regular, white, again. These newly emboldened real Americans issue angry orders to the rest of us. If you don't like it, go back to where you came from, they say. There is no back to where I came from. You stole my homeland from me. Me from my homeland, I mean. I don't even know where it is, literally. You see, I came from Sylvie. I am the untallied, unpaid, unrepented damages of one of America's founding crimes. I come from people who endured the psychocultural genocide of slavery, reconstruction, and Jim Crow, who began to find a place here really only quite recently amid strides toward effecting a more perfect union of liberty and justice for all. I am Sylvie's great, 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 great granddaughter. Sylvie was a slave 
who lived on a plantation in the late 1700s in Charleston, South Carolina, the harbor town through which close to one in two African slaves entered America over the century, centuries, our Ellis Island. Sylvie bore three children by her master, Joshua Eden, by which I mean he raped her. There is no consent in slavery. Sylvie's daughter, Sylvia, was born in 1785, and Joshua freed Sylvie, Sylvia, and their other children some years later. Sylvia gave birth to a son named Joshua in 1810. Joshua had a son named Joshua Jr., born 1845. His daughter, Evelyn, my grandmother, was born in 1896. Evelyn bore my father, George, in 1918, and I was born to him in 1967. The original Americans are the natives whose land was invaded, then stolen by the Europeans. Those descended from the Europeans, the ones who came on ships to the New World, like to think they are the original Americans. But I'm from a third set, from those brought here on different ships over different waters, those whose sweat and muscle were the engine of the American economy for over 200 years, whose blood and tears water America's ground. I come from them. I come from people who survived what America did to them. Ain't I a real American? When the amorphous mob harumphs about the needs and rights of real Americans, they don't picture me, people like me. But is anyone more a product of America than those of us formed by America in an angry war with herself? The contradiction of being less than in a nation whose forming documents speak of liberty and justice for all, plagued me for much of my young adult life. I'm so American, it hurts. I'm gonna leap from that, no, thank you, thank you, no, no, thank you. No need to applaud, I'm not done, you're good, you're good, thank you. I'm gonna leap from that. I'm gonna tell you that I experienced what black kids do in this country. I learned there was something wrong with black and brown skin as a child of three and four, watching how strangers looked at my daddy, who was tall and dark and strong and beautiful, and how I was excluded from the gifted and talented program, and how I was asked, I was told, I don't think of you as black, I think of you as normal, by a white friend trying to pay me a compliment in Middleton, Wisconsin and how they wrote the N-word on my locker on my 17th birthday in my high school when I was student body president of my all-white high school, and how I never told anybody about the fact that they wrote the N-word on my locker, was too ashamed to be the N-word, the nigger of my town, was so ashamed of that, I just took it in, and it metastasized inside of me for decades. I spent decades trying never to be called that word again trying not to be the black person loathed, feared, despised, disregarded. I stand here with two graduate degrees, a former corporate lawyer, a former dean at Stanford, with a book about how in those years I experienced such self-loathing, trying to locate a self I could love. And um, so I'm gonna read now from the, toward the end as I have finally unearthed through work with a coach, I finally was able to say out loud to this coach, brought in to work with the senior staff in my department at Stanford, all white, I'm the youngest, I'm the only person of color. When they bring in a coach, I think my job is to tell her what's wrong with everyone else, because <laughs> I'm so confident that I'm doing this work well, and I have some of my, one of my students' parents in the audience, so it's you know, so I'm feeling successful, feeling like I'm doing a good job, but I'm getting feedback that I'm too aggressive and too emotional. And I think, might as well give me a list of all the stereotypes of black people, black women, and tell me not to do those things. But with a coach, um, she helped me appreciate, she wasn't trying to tell me not to be me, she was asking me, can you figure out what's causing the angry, the, pa the angry outbursts, the passion, the, the, the bigness that's too hard for people? If you can figure out what's triggering you, you can figure out what's hurting you, maybe you can be a little bit more intentional about when to bring it and when not, when to speak, when to be silent, when to go off on somebody or not. And she was telling me you know, not to be quiet, but to be in charge of my voice. Um, 
And in my conversation with my coach, I was able to tell her, finally, this horrible truth that when I was a child, I was ashamed to be black. When I was a child, I was afraid of black people. When I was a child, I wanted to be what white people valued. I was so ashamed to summon the truth of that into my consciousness, but I knew that it was at the heart of what ailed me. Somehow I had done that work and knew that. And saying it to myself began to loosen the grip from me, the grip of racism that was on my heart and my brain, you know, that made me loathe my own people. The American narrative about black people can make us loathe ourselves. It is a terrible, terrible thing that's done to us. And so emerging from that, I was finally able to love myself as a black person. And I was able to go out into the world onto the Stanford campus and look at all the black people and it was as if, as if they all got a memo saying, smile at Julie today. And of course they hadn't all gotten a memo. It was that I was finally able to see myself as a black person and love that self. And by extension, I could now see and love the folks in the black community. And then I was able to speak with this kind of voice. So this is from the section of the book called Declaring. So we've gone from desperate to belong, self-loathing to emerging, declaring. White Americans, you are infatuated with the Statue of Liberty, whose tablet contains words of welcome for all, who did in fact welcome you and your ancestors, and you are simultaneously infatuated with carving lines and borders between who does and does not belong here, with yourselves on one side of the line and the other half of America on the other. You think your whiteness makes you better than the rest of us. You make us your scapegoat, your excuse for your violent rage. It's not all of us. Stop saying it's all of us, you say, my white brethren. You want to be treated as an individual instead of a stereotype. And I will get out of bed anyway and go out into the streets of America to do my work, to find true love, to raise children who know how to work hard and be kind to others, to speak. We the people cannot continue to abide the stories of police and civilians on witness stands telling us that in just seeing our black bodies, they were terrified. You have to be terrified for a justifiable reason. God gave us this black and brown skin. The skin God gave us is not a reason for you to be justifiably terrified. We are terrified of you. We continue to try to forgive, to live. Even dying and in death, it seems, we deserve no human mercy. Eric Garner told police, I can't breathe, when they had him in a chokehold for selling cigarettes illegally. Tamir Rice lay gasping for breath, his toy gun on the ground nearby, and the policemen who shot him standing over him, did not offer CPR to this 12-year-old boy they knew by then was only a child with a toy gun. Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown were left dead on the sidewalk for hours, their bodies unclaimed. The local police do not even lift these boys' bodies off the sidewalk, do not properly care for the corpse. The mothers frantically call, text, plead, have you seen my son? Please, help me find my son. My son, I look at the faces of Trayvon, Freddie, little Tamir, who was all of 12, and I see you, my son, my precious son, my beautiful black boy, so smart and bookish and inquisitive and philosophical. I see you grow taller, grow muscles, grow a man's face, and I weep for the future self who will leave this home and discover that in pockets of this great country, you are loathed, feared, and worse. My son, you did not ask to be born. I chose you. 
I asked you to be mine. I gave you a skin of brown. And you are exquisite beyond measure. And this is the section, Black Lives Matter. You, hiding there behind your draperies across the street, it was you acting like Zimmerman who called the cops about a, quote, disturbance in your neighborhood. You, who said there were multiple juveniles who do not live in the area or, quote, have permission to be there, which you know because you guard the white experience and you know who belongs at the pool and who does not. It was you who saw a black man getting into a nice car and decided he was stealing it and called the police who trailed him, pulled him over, pounced five at a time on his 25-year-old black body, this former student of mine, this man now getting a PhD in engineering at Northwestern, driving his own damn car. It is you who call your dogs, who bring their dogs to bring us down, to keep America white, to buff us out of your existence. You want to stand your ground. It means arm the whites. You think if given the choice, any of us would have asked to be born black in America? You think we want to be the object of your evident fear as you pass us on streets and crowd away from us on elevators? In the wake of the Zimmerman verdict, Questlove wrote so hauntingly about this. He described himself as a six foot two, 300 pound black man and pleaded, I mean, what can I do? I have to be somewhere on earth, correct? Correct. Sometimes I wonder, where is God in all of this? But then I wonder if maybe God gave us the choice. Maybe he gathered a group of souls together and asked for volunteers. Maybe he said, now who wants to go down there and inhabit a black or brown body? Who wants to take that on? Who wants to live a life in America where you may be treated like the scum of the earth? Who will walk among white people and be their opportunity to learn compassion? And the bravest souls looked around at each other and raised their hands. Thank you. Wow. Whew. I just had so many thoughts. I was just thinking about my youngest brother, who's six foot four. And people usually think he's Latino. He's got really long, black, curly hair. Um, he usually braids it down. And there's been all these moments where I'm terrified, like, is he going to get you know, pulled over by the police, or there was a time when he was, you know, accosted by the police and was not doing anything. And it's that moment of impinging terror as somebody who's like the oldest child, half mini parent goes through yeah. with my mom. Um, yeah, I, and the way you talk about it with both of your children, Avery and Sawyer, is very different in the book. I was wondering, maybe you might wanna start Sure. By talking a little bit about that, since yeah. we have a lot of parents today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my son Sawyer is an 18-year-old uh, freshman at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Um, and my daughter Avery is a 16-year-old junior at a high school kind of like this one in Palo Alto, Gunn High School. Um, my husband is white and Jewish. Um, and as any of us know who play the interracial marriage, child rearing, childbirth odds, um, my, your kids, what they're going to look like, who knows, right? So my son is slightly darker than I am, phenotypically black. He's not mistaken for anything else. Uh, my daughter looks more like her dad. Those of us who are mixed, I think, can spot mixture. Um, but I think to most white folks, um, uh, she, she looks white. Sometimes black folks. Sometimes. And sometimes black folks. All right, right, right. <laughs> well, you know. Okay, so um, my task with Sawyer, who I've raised in Palo Alto, is, as is the task of any parent raising a black child, particularly a black male child today, um, we have the talk. You've given it or you've read about it. And um, this is the talk that we try to have repeatedly with our children, particularly our sons, to try to ensure that when they go out into the world, if something goes down, if they're pulled over or they're in a group of kids and someone decides there's a problem, that they know that they have to put their hands in the air and behave in an extremely deferential way 
to authority because they must not take the chance that that authority figure um, does not presume that they with the brown skin are the wrongdoer. Our task is to try to ensure that our kids get home safely. We all want that. And so we teach them about putting their hands in the air and not to defend themselves. And my anguish is always about my son and that music and knowing he might reach into his pocket before they made the headphones with the thingy on him here to turn it off. I knew he was going to reach into his pocket to turn off his music out of respect so he could hear. And that's when they were going to think he's reaching for something in his pocket. And so what I have in the narrative in the book is, baby, please do not reach into your pocket. Do not even turn off your music, you know. And how do you give the talk? The challenge is to give the talk repeatedly and yet not diminish their sense of self. We must also raise our black and brown children to love themselves and not to take on the stereotype, not to be self-loathing or fearful. They have the right to love themselves, to walk out of our homes and find joy in the world as any child does. So we have to equip them with this strength, which has within it the implication, it is implied that some think something is wrong with them. You know, how to narrowly, how to walk that line so they are safe and strong and self-loving. That's our challenge. With my daughter, um, my fear for her is that because she is light, that she will be in places and pockets and hear things no one would dare say with someone like me in the room or somebody darker than me in the room, that she will hear things that devastate her. And I want her to have such a strong sense of self that she will not cower and hide and pass, mm -hmm. that she will say, do not say that around me. You're talking about me and my mother and my people. You're talking about Sylvie. She knows about her slave ancestor, Sylvie. And late in the book, I joke with her. I say, you know, sometimes I think, you know, about the other names we would have named you if we hadn't named you Avery. And she said, she was 15, she said, I wish you'd name me Marin. I said, well, that was on daddy's list. He liked that name, but I never <laughs> liked it. And then I paused and I said, I kind of think I should have named you Sylvie. And she said, oh, mom. I'll name my own daughter Sylvie. And right, I try not to cry in front of, you know, my teenagers. So, um, but I cry every time I think about this. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, I want Avery to be proud of who she is. I don't want Avery to be sort of um, walking through the world, um, hearing things that harm her and struggling with what do I do. I want her to love herself and her ancestry of all stripes. Uh, the Eastern European Jews, you know, who are her ancestors, the African and African-Americans who are her ancestors, and the white British coal miners my mother came from. Mm -hmm. I want her to be proud of all of it. And ultimately, identity is something we, we pull to ourselves. When we're, you know, Du Bois said, identity is in part how others see you and in part how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. In my experience, it's, it was largely how others saw me, you know, and I finally forged a self that is without regard to what others think or how they see me. You know, I'm hoping for my daughter that she finds a sense of belonging in a community that can embrace and love her for who she is and for how she shows up. And I hope that I've raised a daughter, despite having light skin, who cares deeply about the experience of black people. Yeah. And that's such a real experience too, to be in a space and people don't know, and then they see a clue and then they say something and then you're like, please don't get it twisted. Like, I remember one time, I was a student at Loyola University about 20 years ago, and I had a picture of Audre Lorde above my desk. I was on the student newspaper there. And then somebody asked me, why do you have all those pictures of black people above your desk? I'm like, I said, cause I'm black. <laughs> and they were like, oh, and then the whole conversation changed, the social tenor of the room changed. Yeah. Like, yeah, we'll invite her to stuff because she's on the staff, but we don't tell her about these other parties, you know? Yeah. And to know that I was kind of like, by that time I felt like I had a sense of self, but this, I wanted to just fight for little Julie in this book so bad. Like I was telling you earlier, I'm like, you need a sister. Because I was like, I feel like when I think about what my parents did, right? It's a different, this is a coming of age story completely. Yeah. 
and then seeing you when you finally come into your consciousness about how you talk about race, how you see yourself within that. And then you're able to reach back to other young people who are finding themselves. It makes that arc even more powerful that you were describing earlier. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we have a lot in common and we have a lot uh, about our backgrounds that are that is dissimilar. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a physician and was a political appointee of Jimmy Carter. You know, so I was raised middle class and then upper middle class. Mm -hmm. So with the light skin and the middle and upper middle class privilege, I led a different life than Tara. Yeah. And um, you want to say? Yeah. Um, we were, we were kind of joking about it in the car. I joke about it at this point because I have students from all different stripes and areas of the Chicago area. And by benefit of, of what my parents did, my mother taught me how to read when I was five. She came from French immigrants. My father came from black folks from the South and Cairo, Illinois. But my father was not pedigreed in any sense of the word. He was kind of a thug actually. And he made money by illegal means that put me through private school for my early formative years in education. And I was raised in a neighborhood, poor working class neighborhood, lots of factories that shut down as I was coming of age. But I grew up where my mom was the only white person in the neighborhood in yeah. Kankakee, Illinois. And yeah, I was telling people earlier about instances of racism. I, I remember the first time it was called the N word, but I also remember being in my grandfather's car and he was the first black man to buy a Cadillac in Kankakee, Illinois. And people saying that with pride. Yes. Or being, you know, the child of Benny Jr. and everybody in the neighborhood knows Benny Jr. and listening to Bobby Blue Bland records and Al Green and having that be part of the foundation of something that says you're a part of this and you are loved, right? Yeah. And it's a very different experience when you have, like, and little Julie doesn't get to see that. She well, occasionally right. sees the Jack and Jill kids. Right. You know, right. So we, I had this there. sort of uh, outward trapping of uh, worth. Yeah. My family had more money than your family. My parents chose to spend that money mm -hmm. on a house in an all white town. And if I could go back and undo one aspect of my childhood, it would be the decision to raise me in my adolescence in Middleton, Wisconsin, outside of Madison, mm -hmm. where it was an entirely white community, 1,200 kids. I'm the senior class student body president as the only black kid at the school. There were two Jewish families, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't, there wasn't a soul, my father traveled all the time. My black parent was in the heyday of his career and just, and not a present parent, loving, but not available. And I didn't have anybody around who, when I was knocked down, with the N-word. There was nobody who could extend their hand and say, and pull me up and say, I've been there, mm -hmm. little sister. You know, I've been there, you'll be okay. Right. You know, here's how we get through this. Yeah. And when I think about, you know, my own kids, I've raised them in a much more diverse community. Palo Alto is, is richly diverse with um, Asian mm -hmm. uh, families, Indian American, Chinese American, Korean American, it's about 40% Asian, 42% white, and the rest of us, you know, few, few probably two or three percent black, and then the mm -hmm. remainder Latino, I think. Um, there are no families, that, there are very few families who look like ours. Very few kids whose you know, mixture is, is that of my kids' mixture. Mm -hmm. And when somebody came to a party for a school fundraiser for the Palo Alto Public Schools, you know, where I was working the party to try to you know, be on the committee, you know, be on the committee, serve the stuff. Some lady walks around, it's a murder mystery party, and she shows up in blackface in 2015, 14, Palo Alto, yeah. you know, I got nobody to talk to and say like, what the fuck is this? You know, like, and I look and across, like sorry, if anyone got kids in the room, young kids. <laughs> I look across the bay to Berkeley and Oakland and know now that if I had the consciousness that I have now, if I had it when I bought my house, you know, I would have chosen to raise my kids over there, take the hour plus commute to Stanford, but raise them in a community where they'd have peers and mentors mm -hmm. who could extend that hand. Speaking of that, that scene in the party, I'm really kind of pleased at the noticing that your husband does in that scene. Because I think a lot of people don't talk about what is not just the role of the white parent, but what's the role of the white spouse in that situation, right? 
how do they respond to their partner? Because sometimes even in relationships, I think people forget, you need to be attentive to this thing that your partner experiences. And there's this moment, I think he like, he makes eye contact with you, like he knows you're thinking, what is this? And then, <laughs> you, you know, he's like, okay, time to go. Yeah. You know, cause he knows this is just untenable. It's unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, he's an introvert, my beloved. He, I've been with him for 30 <laughs> years and I'm the extrovert and he's the introvert. And um, I would never expect um, Dan to stand up and turn off the music and say, you know, what the F are you people doing? That's not him. Right. Um, but I do know that Dan has my back and will look across the room and see me and signal we need to get out of here. Right. His focus is on looking after me and looking after us. I'm the one that's going to take up the issue the next day and, uh, you know, write to the principal about the school. And, you know, the lady gets wind of the fact that I was offended. You know, so I get one of those emails. If to the extent you were offended, I'm sorry, right? If you were offended. And I just Googled blackface and put the link, you know, the URL to the Google of blackface in my response. She showed up at my door to apologize, which I give her a bit of credit for. But the narrative in our community is that I overreacted to a bit of fun. Mm, no. No, I know, <laughs> I know. And I mean, I, and you make me think about this a lot because I've been so brash my whole life. I almost had that moment earlier when I was talking about the black card. Yeah. Because we had a young oh, yeah. person at the earlier talk who was being questioned about their blackness. And they were talking about, how do you respond to that? And I was like, look, with everything I've been through, don't ever question my black card, because you will, you will get it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and just thinking about that, like, that you go through that, and you shouldn't even have to prove that anymore. It's like, we're be, you know, not to say we're beyond that, but it's like, there's so many parallel experiences that do happen, that you can't question that it's an authentic experience, especially you know, we were talking about how even if you are mixed race in this country and maybe you are, you know, it's kind of like when they make fun of Jasmine Dubois in the boondocks mm -hmm. and she's like, I'm Irish, I'm German, I'm black, I'm Creole. I'm... And then Huey just looks at her and says, you black. You black. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we know how the social circumstances set that up. That's right. I mean, we know that America was um, founded on an ideology um, of, of racial hierarchy. Mm -hmm and the one drop rule, the notion that whiteness is pure and blackness is a stain. And so one drop, a picture of a drop of black paint in a mm -hmm. white, a can of white paint, that can of white paint is never white again. Mm -hmm. So that was the notion of, you know, one drop of blackness stains you and makes you black. And it was a rule and an algorithm that allowed for the perpetuation, the burgeoning of the population of slaves as more and more slaves were raped by their masters, creating lighter children to ensure that those children remain slave classified. So this rule, the one drop rule exists to this day, if not in the laws, in the mindset in America, where we know, I mean, just look at the, the media around terrorism, right? right? Right. If it's a brown person, right? They're, if it's a Muslim, they're a terrorist. If it's a black person, they're a thug. You know, mm -hmm. if it's a white person, they are mentally deranged and it's some problem they have, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, we have, you know, this sense of fear of people based on the color of, of one's skin. And it's, it's why we tell parents of mixed race children. Mm -hmm. Certainly when I was coming up in the early 70s, and I'm older than you, but you know, so I'm born 67, so around about 72, 73, I'm hearing from my parents when I come home with the question, what am I? Because my friends, my white friends are asking, they say, you're black and we're a black family. My white mother said, we're a black family. And I found that perplexing because I could already tell that something seemed to be wrong with blackness in the eyes of some white folks. So why is my white mother not lifting us out of the pit? Why are we a black family if black is the lesser thing? Why doesn't she use her whiteness to lift us? You know, that was a thought I had as a five-year-old. But they were told Teach your kid they're black. You know, the world will treat them as black, so teach mixed kids that they're black. It's, mm -hmm. it's the right philosophy, but my parents 
said we're a black family, but raised me among white people, mm. you know, without connections to black institutions, to the black church, um, to black mentors. They didn't take an interest in my having black peers. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what it meant. I literally, literally, I'm using that word accurately, <laughs> watched the Cosby show for clues on how to be someone like me. It came out in the fall of my senior year of high school. Cliff Huxtable, Bill Cosby was a doctor. He had all these kids. They were, you know, some of them had skin like mine. And I looked at Lisa Bonet, who played Denise, who was kind of my age on the show, literally for clues about how to behave, how to dress, how to talk, how to act, what to want out of life. And I was desperate for clues. So when biracial was offered as a categorization of humans in the late 80s, when I had just finished college at Stanford, biracial, multiracial came onto the scene. I clung to it. It was like a lifeline. It was finally a way not to you know, deny the existence of my white mother. Finally a way to explain why I was so different from most black folks, you know, and no one ever thought I was white. But then I came to this place of locating a self I could love within blackness. You know, so I, I am proudly black now. I don't say I'm biracial. I, I'm happy to explain it as biracial. I have a white mother, black father, mm -hmm. but I don't cling to belonging to biracial mm -hmm. because I found belonging amid blackness. And while I have been coming up in years at 49, the black community has expanded its consciousness to accept the myriad differences among us, not just in skin tone and hair type and manner of speech, and socioeconomic status and what we do for a living and how we're educated. You know, all of it, we've come to accept within blackness that the black box is not this tiny, you know, it's really quite big mm -hmm. and there's room for, for all of us. Right, and that whole, it, it was kind of interesting, like I was talking to Grant earlier, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, but, <laughs> she's and, about to. But we had, a, we had a little interesting conversation we were talking about how sometimes other students will come to other students and question you in that way and kind of be like, well, you know, you ain't really down like that. You're not black. And I'm just like, don't test it. Because I feel like there are these moments where we could say, OK, what's really the barometer for how you qualify that? You know, mm -hmm. is it do you grow up in a household and you have black relatives? Do you grow up in a household where you've been an adopted child? Do you grow up in a household where you had a certain set of experiences? Right, And if you're not thinking about it in that way, then you shouldn't question mm -hmm. other people right, as to the extent of how they fit. It should be, this is home, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, to me, blackness is ancestry right. plus consciousness, right. you know, or a conscious committedness to the experience of black folk in America. Exactly. You know, to take an interest in our community and in bettering opportunities for our folks and in fighting, uh, advocating um, for, um, you know, for more opportunity and for fair treatment for black people. Yeah. And that's more of a qualitative experience than trying to say, okay, we have this much melanin per square inch, yeah. right? Because yeah. we know that's a falsehood anyway at this point in American culture. Um, I also found myself thinking too, there was this one part in the book where you start to cross things out. I think it's... Yeah. Is I, it in that version that you have? Yeah. Oh, Do you good. have a different version? No, no, no. Did it didn't it make out? it into the pre... No, it's in there. It's my favorite page. I love this part. Yeah. So can, can I... I you, should I try to read it? You want to read it? Cool. I would love that. And then we can talk What were talk you going to say? It. Did I? Is that... Okay. No. no okay, please. so you guys, um, <laughs> this is the start. Uh, it's my favorite page of the book. It's hard to read because it does have strike throughs, and I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure how to accomplish that with you know, a reading, but I'm, I've done it a few times. We'll see how it goes. So this is the start of the, chap, of the part of the book, Black Lives Matter, which is um, the eighth chapter, the eighth part. And the final part is onward. It's sort of a summation, try to tidy it all up. So this is the beginning of the Black Lives Matter chapter or part of the book. Trayvon was my Pearl Harbor the line demarcating before and after, the moment I knew blackness is the core chord of my life. Because 
whatever, despite my strange, imperfect history, inadequacies as a per with blackness, a black person, a mother, my inadequa, because I am raising a black son. He was murdered on February 26, 2012, not in Ferguson, but in Sanford, Florida, a neighborhood a lot like mine. I read of it a few days later in a small newspaper, weeks before March 17th, which was when the New York Times would pick up the story. The Zimmerman verdict of not guilty on all counts came on July 13th, 2013, and plunged like a cannonball into the murky self-loathing in my psyche and displaced every bit of that self-loathing. And the water that rushed back in its wake was a torrent of bitter tears and anger. And the calm stillness that followed was pure love for my people and for Trayvon. When I see his face, all I see is my son. Thank you. And I just kept thinking, I'm like, that moment where there's the strike throughs, and you, it reads different when you take out the strike throughs. It reads differently when you read it with them together. And I'm just like, that it kind of captures that whole sense of trying to define yourself and saying, I can rewrite the story, you know? And you see the voice starting to do that really in that section in a way that's like, I can assert this and I'm good with this. I accept yeah. this yes. and embrace it. Yes. You know? Yeah. So for me, it feels like the victory in the book. It's not just, you know, I tell people a lot, I don't want to see the tragic mulatto story. If you read American literature and African American literature, that's the story that we get. Right. And so it's taking the turn away from that. Yes, there are challenges that yeah. this child faces and this young woman faces in the book. But there's also that moment, it's like she's not held a crane, you know, and we're in the 21st century. So how do we write her story in a way that doesn't reflect those stereotypes? So I'm kind of curious, do you ever look at the older stories of interracial writers and think about that too when you, when you sat down to write this book at least? Um, the literature uh, from the biracial, interracial, multiracial community uh, that has really burgeoned, of course, in the last 25 to 30 years, mm -hmm. um, tends to be, or at least what I've read, has tended to be about you know, embracing the fact that we are a new type of people. Danzi Senna's new book that's just out in mm -hmm. August, uh, she wrote a beautiful novel called Caucasia um, about mixed race kids of divorced parents, one black, one white, and one goes and lives. Mm -hmm. They each live with the parent they more resemble. So if it was my family, my son would be with me and my daughter would be with my husband. It's this beautiful novel called Caucasia. Mm -hmm. Danzi has a new book out, a new novel called New People. Mm -hmm. and, I, and a lot of the literature does seem to head toward this place of we're actually, you know, this is the future, we are different people, we are neither this nor that, or we're 100% we're this and 100% that. You know, we are biracial, we are multiracial. And um, because my own journey has been really back to black, um, I don't identify with, with that particular way of thinking about. So, mm -hmm. the, so I think what they're saying is that the mulatto is not tragic, the mulatto is legitimate. The mulatto label is not imposed upon us, we are biracial, we are claiming this, we're not ashamed. Right. We have found belonging with one another. Um, and I love that that's happening and I love for the folks. Um, and in my reality, I love the fact that I was able to actually locate a sense of self I could love amid blackness. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel a sense of connection to mixed race people, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to walk into a room of mixed folks and you just can see mixture, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody looks different from everybody else, but you know, mm -hmm. everybody's got features that don't match, you know, right. their own features or their own mother or their own father. And, and so I do feel a kinship there mm -hmm. with mixed race people. Um, um, I did feel myself like that tragic mulatto mm -hmm. and felt it was on me to figure that shit out, you know, to not let America, because I was mm -hmm. clear what was doing it to me, mm -hmm. was the American racist narrative about worth of humans exactly. according to skin color. And it was on me, you know, to not uh, accept that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now that I have, I don't, I don't feel 
uh, I don't feel mulatto. You know, I don't feel, mm -hmm. I don't feel tragically anything. I know I, I do not. As soon as I saw that as a young reader, as an idea, I totally rejected it. Not just because, you know, you think about terms like mulatto, octoroon, and quadroon, and I find them really offensive. Because yeah. if you know the history of those terms, they come out of slavery, yeah. you know, and exoticizing women of color in particular, you know, for sexual purposes, for purposes of making them a novelty. And I'm just like, if you ever call me that, there's a fight as afoot. Yeah. But I find that the idea of the tragic mulatto makes them seem, makes the character seem weaker. Yeah. Like they have no agency, they right. can't speak for themselves, they don't fit in anywhere, they are unloved. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a hollow stereotype. Yeah. And then I'm wondering if you go to the other end of the spectrum, how do you feel, I mean, you talk about the idea of new people, right? When it's not, I don't really think it's new people. Right. But It's how just much, the title of her book. Yeah, yeah you know. But it's, it kind of makes me think about that idea of post-blackness, right? And how that's not really functional as a concept to talk about race, even though, you know, we've had this mixed race president, now we can talk about how everything is wonderful, you know? So it kind of feels like, in some ways, your book eschews that narrative, right? Yeah. And I really like how for me as a reader, it reminds me of Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark. Has anybody read that book? It's so wonderful. Um, and she, her main thing is defining how American, the identity of, of the American is always placed against blackness. Yeah. Like there's the American and blackness and blackness is not American. Right. And when you think about that, everything from the beginning of this country to this moment when you see this little girl and she's happy to celebrate the 4th of July, but she doesn't know why her father is not excited about it. That tells me a lot, right? We don't see that connection made in all the time in books like this. Mm. And I think it's important to have that kind of historical, even the historical vein that starts to happen mm. throughout the book. Because it's not just that stuff from the past, it's things that are unfolding as you mature. Yeah. So are there some key events that you'd like to talk about, like that matured and kind of shaped that perspective, like in the larger news that you talk about in the book? A um, couple things come to mind. One is, of course, we're not post-racial and no racist white person on the street knows that you have a black, a, a white parent uh, or that you went to Stanford you know, if they're racist, they see your skin color and they're going to behave accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, America's first mixed race parent, president, um, mixed people might say that, racist white folks just see him black. as the N-word. The and, um, and so we're not post-racial. Um, when we ascend to heights like Barack Obama has or Colin Kaepernick has mm -hmm. or Beyonce has, um, you know, we're expected to just do the job, not have a mind and a spirit. So as Trayvon Martin was murdered and then his murderer was acquitted, Barack Obama said, if I had a son, he would have looked like Trayvon, which was such a true and poignant thing to say. And I remember being in the car listening to the radio as he said it, and it just made me weep. And then he was ridiculed in the conservative media for saying that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like, don't have a humanity. We're not interested in your narrative. It's what's happening with Colin Kaepernick. Right. He's not protesting the flag. He's not disrespectful to veterans. He is using the platform he has as an NFL player to take a knee, which is a respectful act, and say, this anthem, you know, has this verse that is racist, you know, and I am choosing to protest now what is happening to my black and brown brothers and sisters in this world at the hands of police and others in authority roles. And they don't want him to do anything but wear that jersey and throw the damn football. You know, when Beyonce did the formation video, when she, I mean, not the video, but when she performed at the halftime show for the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and had the kind of outfit evoking Black Panthers, 
You know, all of that vitriol just was like, shut up and sing. You know, sing, let us admire your voice and your body, but do not have a mind, do not have a thought, do not express yourself. You know, and that is kind of the conundrum we're in, particularly when we become upper middle class. You become the partner in a law firm. You become the professor at Northwestern. At Northwestern. You become the physician in the emergency room. But you are still the N-I-G-G-E-R to those who will think of you that way. So though we may rise, and you may think, oh, they don't have those experiences. Oh, we're post-racial. Oh, they're, they're, my doctor's black. Yeah, well, your black doctor still gets treated like the N-word, um, depending on where they go. And until that changes, and not just for black doctors, but for all black folks, we are not post-racial. No. And we won't be post-racial until, I mean, I, I read recently that in Germany, all school children are taught about the Holocaust. They're taught about the Third Reich and Hitler and what the Germans did to the Jews. We don't talk about what we did to the Native Americans, the Africans, the Chinese, the Japanese, etc. We don't. We give a tiny little bit of, to slavery in our American history textbooks. At least that was the case when I was coming up. You know, we act as if it didn't happen or it didn't matter. Get over it. Our institutions, our structures are built on this racist structure that didn't pay labor. That's how the capitalist economy got going. You didn't have to pay for labor. They were enslaved and raped to make more of them. Okay, that's how we got here. And until we could have, I dreamed that we could have, if I was Octavia Butler, maybe I would write a science fiction, write presumption that one day we will have a truth process, a listening, a reckoning, a healing. Absolutely. This wound is in all of us as Americans of how we got here and um, of what it's done to all of us. But the fact that we regard each other differently on the basis of our skin tone is so messed up. It is so wrong. And in the 21st century, we ought to be able to transcend the tribalism in all of us that was a good, you know, safety mechanism when we were hunter-gatherers, I suppose, but we're now humans with an internet, right. you know, and globalization. We ought to be able to figure out how it is we can learn to see the other as one of us and have compassion for our fellow humans regardless of our skin color. True. So... I'm going to wrap up so we can take a few questions. It takes me, I'll just close with a really brief anecdote. There's a professor named Dr. Joy DeGruy, and she talks about having a very light-skinned cousin, blue-eyed, blonde. Oh, somebody knows who Dr. Joy is. Yes. <laughs> she's, she's brilliant. So, oh, wow. So she has this one anecdote she tells about her cousin, and they go to the grocery store. Cousin goes into the front of the line, and... She doesn't have any problems, gets her groceries, everything's fine. She writes a check for it. They don't ask for her ID. She comes up behind her and they've been chatting with other people in the line. The woman goes, I need two pieces of ID. Then it becomes, she pulls out the checkbook, the book for bad check writers and looks for her in the book. And then the cousin, who they can't identify what she is, goes, wait a second, what are you doing? You didn't ask for my checkbook ID. You didn't ask, you didn't flip through the book for me. Then an older lady who's white in the back of the line says, no, you didn't, I, where is your manager? You need to come and talk about this. Why are you doing this to this woman when you didn't do it already? And I think it, it brings me back to that point you made toward the end of the book, how we need white allies. And you say it in a couple of different ways in the book. And I think sometimes it's just even in that small occasion we can make something powerful happen. When you see someone inflict that kind of aggression on them in these small moments, you can speak up. You don't have to wait to put up a placard or put a sign in your window. You tell people, this is not right. Yeah. But in any case, I'll leave you with that note. I, I would love to hear some of your questions and I'm sure you would as well. Huh? You gotta give us oh, that's right, I gotta do yeah. a poem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of which, uh, I've been really blessed to be part of a larger community here in the Chicago area. Um, part of that community 
um, which as controversial as it may be in some circles, included Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn. Um, if you know, these are the people that got President Obama in trouble <laughs> at one point in the election. But if you were a community organizer doing anything around education at one point in Chicago, you have probably been in Bill and Bernadine's living room. And I was coming down the steps in my PhD program. I was reading books by the theologian James Cone. And he writes a lot about liberation theology and how people have used faith to overcome racist and racist situations and systemic racism. So I was thinking a lot about that as a teacher. Um, this poem is named after one of his books. It's called Prophetic Fragments. So it's in part Bill and Bernadine, but also hearing Rush Limbaugh in a truck as I come out of my house, <laughs> if that tells you anything. Prophetic Fragments. Prophecy is rendered as whole mythic animal. It twists limbs free and open, wide billowing spread of white dragging reams over daylight. People turn their heads, ignore quiet attrition. I mince downstairs with tender ankle and sore foot, lean into a railing with weight a lover never held. There is no easy sweep that foretells what comes. Besides, one day, steady breath stops. I count inhalations as I deliberately deposit weight on each foot. Underneath, a house's foundation crumbles. The water may be poisoned beyond redemption. It runs, wears away rock, cuts down soil, carries wet in small measures. Prophecy announces titles like liberation Fill in my bag with paperbacks and hardcover spines by poets and preachers like I did that morning when a man sat in a dust-beaten truck listening to the pundit yelling about university students touting liberation theology while sitting in living rooms of dangerous radicals. His truck windows are open and his radio blares. I silently admit truth. I have done all those transgressions. Part of a list longer than this diatribe or James Cone's tome in my heavy book bag. He pulls off without looking at me. I lift my bag strap, bring it closer while I walk to the bus stop. We head to different destinations. Both of us will eventually become dust, but prophecy calls, insists the future will fragment the myth that he listens to and expects. Mm -hmm.